Well, it's, believe it or not, it's actually easier to say the changing face of worship than it is to lead a congregation through the changing face of worship. Uh, Harlan Moore, you've been uh, at church music about the same amount of time that, that I have. Talk to me about the change from when you got into leading worship at a local church to where it is today. Okay. What are some of the changes you've walked through? Well, thank you. Well, since my start in the early church, a lot has happened. Um, <laughs> no, the early church is the 9 o'clock service. Um, it's really been, it's been fun. It's been interesting. It's been challenging. Uh, when I started, you know, obviously... Um, things were simpler. I think that's probably one way to look at it. Uh, the, first, the first church I served, the pastor chose all the music. He sang the solo before he preached. Um, my, my role was kind of limited in that sense. Uh, it's been interesting to see how it's grown from that, from the planning standpoint of, of having a team plan instead of a, a senior pastor or, or a worship pastor by themselves. Technologically, it's obviously it's changed. So many things stylistically, but I think, I think we're discovering now the deeper issues that are involved in change, and that's something we're looking at. It's not just a surface thing. Change is happening because of deeper levels, and I'm thankful for that. I think we're coming to terms with some things now that we didn't face before yeah. um, in our worship planning. We're really beginning to understand the depth of what worship is, and that's what's exciting for me. Yeah. Yeah. Paulo, you've... Uh you grew up in a, a different country, what did you say, until you were nine years old and then came to America with, uh, with your folks. You've got the cultural aspect as well as the, the changes going on in church, but you have helped lead at least one congregation through transition. What were some of the, the deciding factors that you and your pastor came up with when you were starting to lead your congregation through transition? What made you decide the change was needed? Well, I think the... Uh the church itself has a personality and as a pastor tries to read the personality of the church just like we have love languages the church has its love language as well and uh, and as they blossom in that and as we learn to do church together I think uh, we have to listen and see and also just the culture uh, of, the, of the particular area that you're in whether you're in the Bible Belt or in somewhere else uh, people just need to uh, uh, to be able to to express the worship in the, in the way that feels natural and comfortable for them. So. Brandon, you're, uh, you're one of the younger guys up, up here. You grew up in, the, in a Nazarene in a parsonage in a, in a pastor's home. From your perspective, how is leading worship in a local church different now than it was uh, in the church that you grew up in? Um, a couple things come to mind for me. I, I, growing up in the church, I, we sang out of hymnals, and I remember when we started using the overhead projectors with the transparencies, right? And, uh, and then finally the projectors the, and Media Shout and Power, Pro Presenter and all that fun stuff. And so I think that the technological role of uh, whoever gives leadership to a worship team and the worship of a local church um, I don't know that that was real important when I was growing up and, and the guys that kind of came before me um, in, in worship leading. I don't know that the song leader or the music pastor or whatever the title may have been given at the time was probably expected to be a whiz with sound systems and video systems and, and all of that. So I think some, there's some different expectations, but it seems like there, there is also an increased awareness of the importance of the worship leader as pastor, as, um, as a real uh, pastoral presence with their congregations. And I think it's because of this um, need for almost constant transition, almost constant tweaking and contextualizing how we worship um, and what, what the body of Christ in a local place uh, needs and, and fits and is right for a local place. If the person up there strumming the guitar, playing the keyboard, or just singing or whatever, um, is is not concerned with the pastoral needs of of the local congregation, um, I think that's where we start to get off base, and it becomes a show, and it becomes more about the people on the stage performing rather than the people on the platform using their influence to lead the congregation in worship. So I'm I'm hoping that uh, the my generation and the coming generations of worship leaders are aware of their need to really be interdisciplinarians who can kind of work in media and technology and culture and and liturgy and worship and and understanding that whole breadth of of things but also that they're aware of the the need to be pastors yeah. Yeah. I would open this question to, to anyone sitting around here 
Is there anything that would help prepare a, a worship pastor out there to lead his congregation through change? I'm not just talking about the music aspect, but leading a congregation through change. I've done it at, at three different congregations, and every time it was like, uh, they never taught me this in any seminar, and I don't know how to do this. I've been handed an assignment and wasn't sure exactly how to do it. Uh, I can speak into it, but, but I'd like to hear from somebody else of how do you, how do you prepare for that? Um, something that I really found effective in my leading of people, because that's what we're doing as we're leading people, um, is vulnerability. I think in, in my context, um, it helped me to be very vulnerable with the people that I was leading, um, to be honest about where I'm worshiping from and honest about my humanity as a leader. I think especially in a big church, um, that's the first thing that gets taken away is your humanity when you're leading people and you're up there and they're down in the congregation. It's so easy for them to put you at a distance. And when you break right through that as the leader, um, I think that's been effective for our church, mm -hmm. especially in periods of transition where they're trying to figure out, can I, can I trust this person? You yeah, know? Yeah. Um, so I think the key to gaining that trust is just being honest about who you are and what you're going through. So, Good, good. Anybody else want to speak into that the preparation? Along with the trust thing is just a credibility issue. And I don't think you get that overnight. I think, I think those kind of relationships are only built after several years. And you really can't lead transition as a newbie. You can't, you can't just come in and say, we're going to change things now. I think you, ha you have to learn to love the people. And they have to learn to love you and trust. And that takes time. That's one of the things about transition. Sometimes it's, mm. it's tried too early or it's tried too fast. The, uh, the last church I served at for, for 10 years, uh, when I got there, they kind of handed me this template and said, this is where we're going, now you get us there. Yeah. And I just looked at it and said, uh, well, why are we, why are we doing this? Uh, I was handed a template that said, we want to do a black gospel service. I, I told Paulo at lunch the other day this story, and I said, well, is it because we have so many no. gospel musicians? Yes. No, we don't have any. Oh, is it because we have so many people in our congregation that are crying out for a black gospel? No. We just thought that's what we needed. <laughs> and I just said, well, what would drive us yeah. to make that decision? So for two years, it was pretty much hell on earth, my job of trying to fill the template that they gave me. And so finally, I just I decided I'm going to visit every adult fellowship on Sunday morning after I've led worship and I had about 40 Sunday school classes to go visit over the next year and the whole concept for me was I went in and said when you worship as individuals I want to know your heart language how do you worship what is involved in your personal worship and they would stand up and start complaining about what they didn't like in the worship <laughs> services and I said nope stop stop we're not gonna go down that road I want to hear how do you worship and we started compiling all of everything that they told me and about that much of it was music and the rest of it was this big discussion of this is what I would love to I would love for there to be some times of silence in our worship okay all right that I would love for there to be times of corporate prayer when we all prayed the same prayer out loud okay it has nothing to do with music and we started listing all these things that our congregation was begging for that there was their heart language and we thought if we just got the f the right four songs in the right style we'll, we'll do what needs to be done and it's not that simple of a formula and and what I what you said about uh, gaining the trust it took me three years to find out the DNA of our congregation now start ministering to the people that God gave us. Now I can start helping them to transition to where we, to where we need to go. Has anybody else gone through a, a, a time of that, that big of a transition or a transition where you just proactively had to make decisions? I'm going to head this way and, and try to lead the congregation through. Again, I've seen places like what you described where the, the pastor said, okay, it's time to transition. And 
and when they limit it to just the the music the, we we missed the whole transition the transition you know begins in the heart and then it goes to the head and you, yeah. and then it, eventually it will affect the music yeah. but that trust equity that everybody's been talking about man that's just that's it to me yeah yeah and it's a, a constant for me it's been a constant transition that I'm always going through and and you you're you're hoping that you're earn the right to lead them with you I I haven't uh, led a, a congregation through transition. I'm fairly new at this. I've been at my church for a little over five years, and um, but but I I do think I can speak for the younger generations that I th- I think the church has kind of gotten it wrong that what is needed is just a different style or different that like the key is song selection and or whatever that uh, if we just get that right that the young people are going to come flocking in. I think and we talked about about this a little bit this morning, um, but. The, I think that younger generations are really attracted to authenticity, churches that um, are doing what they do well, but are being who they are. And so when a church that can't pull off contemporary worship well is trying to do something and doing it poorly, that doesn't attract anybody. That's not going to attract young people. That's not the key. And, and so when I, anytime I speak to churches that are saying, you know, well, we really feel like if we could just get, a, you know, hip young guy or girl in to lead our congregation in worship that we could, you know, win the young people in our community. And I just say, listen, you know, do what you do well. And if that's singing out of the hymnal with a piano, I think that the young people are a lot more attracted to real forms of community, churches that are making a difference in their community, that are living life together and are doing mission together and compassion together. And I really don't think that I think worship is really vitally important in all of that, but that it's not just the linchpin that we tend to think that it is. Um, and just doing things with, with purpose and doing things, um, doing things with excellence and with authenticity is much more important to the young generations. And it's not, it's not just being loud or playing contemporary songs. Um, I'm seeing many young, young Christians choose churches based on a lot of other reasons besides worship style. And, uh, and I, I want to kind of give freedom and permission to especially smaller churches that don't have the personnel and the ability and the technology to do contemporary worship well. Just don't, don't try to get, you know, don't put your dog in that race because it's, it's just not worth it. Yeah. So where does the decision, where does the decision need to be made? We're going to transition. We're going to make a change. Where does that need to come from? I think often with the with the pastor and the staff and the people who've been in leadership there, but also realizing what God has given you there. Uh, God's provided everything you need to do music the way he wants it at his church. And so he will provide those, those musicians. And if God has given me a full orchestra and he's given me three tubas, and if I stand before him someday and say, God, you should have seen what I could, do, could have done if you would have given me three guitars, uh, God's going to say, what did you do with the tuba I sent you? What did you do with the trombone I sent you? I gave you everything you needed to do music the way I wanted it done. And yeah. I have to stand before him and give account of that. So I have to be a good steward of what he's provided uh, because that is what we do as leaders. And so realizing who is it that you have come to lead? We've come to lead people, and they have gifts and talents, and our job is to bring them together and to make a, an offering to God and to lead this, His children in worship of Him. And so it's, a, it's a important that we not have a, you know, a, a shadow mission, uh, but to have a, a mission that is, is God-breathed, God-provided, and, and how we do music at His church. Yeah. Emily. I'll give, it, I'll give it a small testimony, if you don't mind. Yeah. I grew up in a little more of a liturgical church. Um, I had a music education background. I'm very literal. I still am to this day. <laughs> but um, I was going to a church back in my, my home area, and it was a great church. They had a great choir, a lot of wonderful musicians. Um, but we would go in, and we would sing the same things over and over again. And it was usually from the same books and the same songs. And I could usually sight read those things pretty well. And so so there wasn't a lot of dialogue in the choir practice and so it kind of got lost on me and I kind of faded into the background and the church as the church got bigger I faded further and further into the background so then I changed churches somewhere in there and I actually went to the church where Dave was being a music minister at and I remember I sat down in the first choir practice and I opened up the book and it was the same songs 
<laughs> and I thought, oh my word, what? Okay, God, what? what I'm going to just, I'm going to. I'm going to do this. I'm going to enjoy this. I'm going. I'm not going to get into my old mindset where I just really am being too analytical. Uh, and so what ended up happening was, of course, he's a song guy. So he's always talking about the songs. And so I know that worship just isn't just the songs. But being in the publishing business now and knowing someone like Dave uh, has really, really enriched my life in focusing on the words, the songs, and so he would lead every choir practice that way. I didn't even care about reading the music anymore. We were worshiping in the middle of choir practice. It has changed, and I could go on and on, but it has changed the entire way I worship when I sing, when I talk to the choir, when I talk to people at church. It's changed me as a mom. It's changed me as a wife. It's changed everything about what I do. Now I'm leading that same choir at that church, and I find myself just recalling everything that I've learned over these last 10 years and incorporating it into the worship of my own choir. And I'm not perfect. I don't have all the right answers. But I really, I really think what I've learned there has been, um, well, it's been crucial in my whole life. And now I'm able to share that just as a steward. I mean, I'm not, again, I'm not, um, I'm not perfect. And I'm, I may be there for a while or I may not be. But God has really used Dave and a lot of other people in this publishing uh, company to, to change the way I feel about worship personally. And now I hope that I'm able to pass that on to some people. Good, good. Harlan, were you at your church when the decision was made to add a, a band-led service? Yeah, um, we, we kind of went through a really weird transition. We, we originally, when I got there, we had three, excuse me, we had two services and we added a third, all of which were unique to a degree. And we brought all three services back into one, which I thought I would hate and actually it proved to be one of the best things we did because it, it forced us to look at each other and, uh, and really uh, to decide what kind of a church we we're going to be together. It brought us together. Then, because of space, we split back into two services, which gave us, since we're going to be two services anyway, we decided to go with the contemporary traditional option. I hate that dichotomy, but that's probably the best way to describe it. So we do offer two different types of services which ended up being a positive. And I was going to say earlier that, that when you're dealing with change, you have to look at the reason why you're changing. Um, if I can be, if I can be uh, hermeneutical here for a second, uh, is it out of panic? Some churches change out of panic. Some churches change out of pain because they're suffering. But I think the, the third one, the, to change out of purpose, it, that there is a positive vision you're trying to accomplish and this is what you're trying to do and so the change comes because it's a positive move and not because oh we're trying to we're scramble we're trying to cover ourselves we're falling behind that's panic you don't want to go there but if you're saying we have a positive vision of our future and this is what it looks like and we're going to move in that direction that's leadership and that's what makes a difference i i've been part of so many conversations with pastors who have shared with me if we could just get the music piece right everything will fall into place and that puts a lot of pressure on who the worship person is and I've never felt like everything in the church should rise or fall on a musical s style there's much more there's much more at work here <laughs> we should have the biggest budget at least so, so but to me the, the the Sunday morning has to be centered around the, the word and maybe for some churches around the table and what we are called to do is help bring people in there the the first time i heard the concept for me of heart language you, you talked about heart language and love language we had a missionary from china come speak to our staff and our executive pastor said how can we pray for you and this missionary said if you would pray that god would write up chinese songwriters to write music in the heart language of the Chinese people because we just sing American songs translated. They never get to sing in their heart language. And a light went on with me. I was asking a congregation to sing songs that were not part of their heart language and then wondering why they never really worshiped and they were pushing against me all the time, rebelling. 
and the light went on for me is I have to help my congregation worship in their heart language. Now the difficulty is now we have been asked to be a part not only of worship, but as worship pastors, we've been asked to be a part of church growth and evangelism. And I feel like so many times the whole evangelism thing is handed over. If you get the music right, you will get the people from the community in. Does it work that way? Have, that's kind of always been a little bit of a pet peeve to me because I hear so many worship pastors, they come and they, they kind of vent and they say, well, the pastor's saying that I need to be the one to change, but they don't want to change how they preach. Yeah. So they only want the transition to come from here, but they expect it to move the whole church. And that's, that's a tough weight to put on people that it takes them out of the ability to minister from their language. And, and then you lose all the authenticity that Brandon was talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Are, are, we, are we missing, I, get, I guess as we talk, as we've been talking, I've had this thought that are we talking about something that is, is even relevant to the kind of 80% of our churches that don't have a worship leader and don't, and just have all volunteers and the, and the pastor does choose all the music. Um, I mean, I, I think that credibility, authenticity, purpose, all those things, um, um, trusting God uh, to bring you the people and leading them. That, of course, that's all relevant no matter what size your church is, but what, I mean, I just want to throw out to everybody, what, what do you say to churches that, I mean, we're up here talking about transition, but the, to the church that just says, hey, we, have, we sing with tracks. We don't, we don't have anybody. And what are we supposed to do? How do we do worship in a way that's faithful, a way, you know, you talk about excellence, but how do you do that, you know? I think it goes back to what you were saying about authenticity and also putting people in place that are passionate about what they do, no matter what that is. Um, you, can, you, you know when you look at somebody, when they're, if they're the worship leader, if they're the pastor, if they're reading scripture, you know if they're passionate about what they're doing. And I don't care what it is, if you're passionate, it's contagious. And that can break worship out faster than anything you do. It's just putting people in a place where they just love what they do, period. And also seeing what, what your church values as a, as a people, as a congregation, uh, as a you know, as a region, uh, if it's a certain specific style or using certain instruments, um, you know, you would not be using Chinese instruments in, you know, in, in a non-Chinese culture, for instance. But, um, but understanding what, what that is and, you know, we're always in a state of flux as a culture. Our music in the United States has changed. You know, when I came to the United States, I spoke no English and I quickly had to learn and adapt. And, uh, and since I came in 1973, music has changed quite a bit and I've had to adapt along with it. And that happens within the church as well. And so, uh, and the standard for our people in our congregation, whether we're doing music or video or anything like that, they're living in a world where every movie is underscored. There is not a silent part in a movie. It's odd to have silence in a movie. There's always music. And so there, preconditioned to certain certain things and so when they come to church the expectation is set very high for them musically and so when we can't deliver that or not even aware of some of those things then then it feels odd to them and uh, not to say that we need to mimic the world but we need to realize what it is that is speaking to their hearts and getting their attention and influencing them and using some of those tools to help us in our craft, to help them uh, receive the message, receive the word, prepare their hearts to be attentive to, to the Spirit of God. Yeah, good. You mentioned the, uh, the, the secular world of music. I watch American Idol, The Voice, all the, the TV shows about music, and I, what I see is grandmas and grandpas watching music with their grandkids and their kids, and they're singing Elton John, they're singing The Beatles, they're singing brand new songs and they're all enjoying it but yet when we come to church at least I've been told well grandma and grandpa needs to sing this song and the grandkids need to sing this song 
Music has seemed to divide the generations in the church, but in the world it has seemed to unify. Can anybody help me and speak into how can we unify a multi-generation, an intergenerational approach? I, when I lead hymns at my church, uh, we're pretty contemporary, I play guitar, and uh, it's kind of a rock band sound, both services, um, and we do the same thing twice. But when I lead hymns, I don't do it for the sake of the old people. <laughs> I do it for the sake of a young generation that I refuse to let come up in the church and never sing And Can It Be and never sing My Faith Has Found a Resting Place and never sing the doxology. And, and so we do a lot of the, the modern rewrites of hymns that add a chorus or add a bridge. And, and I hope that our older generation can appreciate and uh, that kind of uh, compromise, I guess. Um, and we sometimes do it in a little bit different sound than it would be if it was piano and organ. But um, it, I think we've got to get, get past some of that and realize that uh, that theological heritage and the richness that's there in the hymns. Um, we can dress them up different ways and make them sound like music sounds today, but that's all, all that is is a tool uh, to, to communicate with, with a, a generation, with a culture. Uh, again, I don't think that that's the be-all, end-all, and if we just get it right and we just you know, get the drums mixed right and get the right guitar tone dialed in that it's, everybody's just going to flock in, that's not the deal. But um, I really think that um, that getting past some of those divisions of this group needs this and this group needs this and so we'll just give everybody what they want. Since when is that even the, yeah, the yeah, Christian yeah. life? Yeah. The Christian life is not about just what I want. We don't know what we want because we're sinners. We're broken and, and the church needs to say I, we know what you need and this is faithful. This is worship. Um, this is God's people worshiping. You know I think um, I hope I don't use to just take over this conversation with a different question but I'm a worship arts coordinator, and so I'm not like a, I don't see myself as just a music person, but instead diving into all that the worship arts are and how dangerous that is to open up that door to all that the worship arts are. And, and I've also, so you come right into the context of all those conversations, which, and, and I think this, we're talking about transition, and a lot of those questions is authenticity, and especially emotion. Like, what does it mean to have emotion in worship? And uh, are we allowing all of the emotions to be involved in our worship? Um, is it a free place for artists to be artists and for art to ask questions? That we're not just up there to make people smile and feel good, but we need to allow art to ask questions. So I know there's a lot there, and I have my own personal opinions that I don't think we do enough of that. You know, I, I don't know what you guys think, but... I think we should allow times for lament in our worship and we should allow for times of sadness if that needs to be so um, as I'm married to a dancer so I've seen how she worships through her dance and how beautiful and intimate that is um, does that have a place in our church or like you're talking about these divisions are those divisions orchestrating how we make those decisions in our in our worship arts so um, I, that might be a bigger topic, talking about worship arts, but you guys probably have, and I won't give the chance to talk about, to all of you probably again, so I'd love to hear what you all have to say about that. I, when, when you were talking, I was thinking about, we were at a table recently with Dr. David Busick, and he threw something out and just in passing, and I think you were there too, Michael, and he talked about pride and prejudice. And I, I haven't been able to get that out of my mind because he talked about the pride in that w the way we think we do it is the right way and, and that should be the way we do it. And that becomes generational. And then the prejudice about how good we think we do it. You know, it's, it's got to be our way and it's got to be at my level. And, and part of that leading that transition, again, it goes back to have we earned the right to introduce a new way of worship to our people and they may not trust the dance but they may trust the person that introduced the dancer and I think that becomes part of the transition too um, I'm, I'm married to a drummer who by nature is a quieter type and his way of yeah well okay he's yeah he's one of the ones that prefers to just be be hanging in the background yeah that's right he's that kind of drummer but Probably, and I'm just going to go out on a limb, but probably one of the uh, most moving times for him in a worship service lately had zero to do with the music, and it was a sermon on communion. 
and he was so moved by just the words and the reflection on the communion. I could tell he was very quiet. He was sitting there, but you could tell he was prayerful, and it didn't have anything to do. He loves drums. He loves the music. He loves to play, but it's his way of worship that's completely different than a lot of these newer modern ways. And it was just just another testimony to how other things other than music can minister and worship to a different personality sitting out there. I hope that one of the shifts, one of the transitions that we're in the midst of is, I'm surprised we haven't hit on this yet, but is bringing an end to this bad habit of thinking of worship as just music and, and beginning to see worship, like you say, as the whole service and as everything that the human person has to offer to God and, and, that, and, and that all of that can be worship. And, that, and I, I feel strongly that that should be guided and, and in some way informed by the ways that Christians have worshiped through the ages. There needs to be some continuity, not traditionalism, but that we are tr- within a tradition, and we're traditioned without being just traditionalists. And, um, but there, but th- there's an endless palette. Uh, you know, there's the, the, it's a big toy box with a lot of toys that we can get out and use to worship God. Um, and you're right, it needs to have that full range of the human experience, or we're not even, we're not being biblical. I mean, read scripture. I, re- <laughs> I just bought for myself, really, but for my six-year-old, too, the Action Bible. That's the comic book version of the Bible. It's awesome. And, uh, of course, it's, a, it's a not an official translation, more of a paraphrase. But we read the story of Amnon and Absalom last night and, you know, these brother, a brother killing a brother. And, uh, and, we, and, it, and it ended. And I said, okay, so what do we learn from this story? And we're talking about just the pain and the, 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 the despair of David and the things that, you know, led him to cry out to God in the Psalms. Uh, about uh, his his son's uh, hatred of one another and their deaths and and that's that's our story. I mean, that's if we're being biblical in our worship, we've got to deal with it. Can't just be celebration and we're all happy and we're all just up for 90 minutes or 60 minutes or whatever it is. Um, we've got to make those spaces for the arts, make those spaces for the range of emotions, and see that as not just like an issue of choosing songs and what key we put them in and those kinds those kinds of questions those are important we need people who have the technical skill to address those things but seeing the whole service as kind of a narrative and and we're taking people from a point of entrance to a point of dispersal into the world and what are we doing with that time it's a really important time and it's not just we sing and then we hear a sermon and then we we're done one of the things that i've learned also over the years and i've just been into a new church here for about six months and Jason and I have a privilege of working together and I lead the service with the choir and the orchestra he leads the service with the band and we we'd say probably guitar driven and choir and orchestra led and um, and that way we don't have to use the contemporary and traditional uh, you know jargon uh, but you know I think that speaks to people but one of the things I've learned over time is just to give per- people permission when they come into and to say, I hope you've come in here ready to worship today. And I know that some of you, it was the hardest thing for you to do was to get out of bed today and walk into a church. And because sometimes we just feel that way. And it's all right. And then other people, you just have to remind and say, you know, this is not about you. And there's no way that I'm going to choose four songs or five songs today that are going to pull that particular string on your heart and give you that warm fuzzy that you want. It's not going to work. Said, and I hope you've had a personal time of, rela- of, of worship this week because this is what we do as an overflow out of our personal worship and try to remind people worship is not something that happens on Sunday that we do for you. It is something that you do and we're just the prompters helping you, uh, you know, uh, worship God. He is the only audience that matters when we're gathered together. And I think when people have that perspective in their minds and in their heart about what is our purpose, why are we here, and they have permission to be themselves and not try to be a specific style or a specific church, then there is a freedom there uh, for them to be expressive and open to each other and to God, and then they're open to what you like and what he likes and what she likes, and they can see and say, oh, I can see that as ministering to Harlan, I can see that as ministering to Jason, and I said, you know, I accept that, and I'm going to let it speak to me as well. So. Good, good. Do we have time for one more question, Mark? I'd like to ask, has anybody learned something about worship from your congregation? What has your congregation taught you 
about worship. I know I've got an answer. I don't know if, if you've thought of it in those terms, because I think sometimes well, we're, we're supposed to be teaching our congregation. I have learned so much about worship from my congregation. Is anybody else in that boat? I think uh, my parents mostly. Uh, my, you know, after we came to the United States, we, we settled. The first church that we visited, we stayed there. My parents are still there 40 years later. And uh, I uh, eventually led the choir in that church, 15 people in the choir. And we would be singing and just praising and worshiping God. And my mom would be behind me. And I could tell that the Spirit was just working within her. And we would be singing in English, and she's singing behind me in Portuguese, and singing those songs from her heart. And there were times when we're, I would tell, tell the, the, you know, the musicians, we're going to do three verses. But at the end of those three verses, my mom was not done. And she would keep going in Portuguese and start singing. And I would just look at them and let's say, Mama's going, let's go for it. And so I learned a lot from, from her just having the heart. And from my dad, I think I was in my 20s. I was already married, and I came to church one, one Sunday morning to lead, and, uh, and he did not look well. And he, was, he had been ill. He had a cold during the week. And I looked at him, and I said, Dad, uh, you shouldn't be here today. You, you don't look well. And he said, Son, I don't feel very well. And I said, Why are you here? And he said, I came out of discipline today. And that, you know, I'd, I've grown up in church. My dad was a pastor. And I think I was at church every time the doors were open. But that day I learned a lesson. And when he said, I came out of discipline today, I said, what, what if I were to come to church every Sunday out of discipline to worship God? And not only discipline, but my heart was totally engaged in this. It was a very important lesson that I learned that day. I think my, I've learned... One of the things I appreciate from my congregation is just the, the songs that they've taught me. Um, and I may be a little strange in this regard, but I don't listen to a lot of Christian music for my own enjoyment, just on my own time. I don't know. Are you like that, Jason? I, I mean, I, I, I draw my inspiration from a lot of other places musically, um, and I, I, I enjoy Christian music, but I don't listen to K-Love. And so they feed me songs, and they f and, and, but one of the best ways is that um, I love doing funerals, especially for the saints of our church. Because, um, of course, Christian funerals are always awesome and, you know, it's the celebration of the life. But the, the song requests that I get at those funerals and the songs I've had to learn to sing at those funerals um, on behalf of those families and, you know, when they ring those golden bells and some of this. I mean, I, I, didn't, I didn't even grow up singing some of those songs. And so I just appreciate the way that my congregation has, has expanded my horizons and some songs that, uh, that, that I'd never sung before that have become dear to me now. I'm going to say one of the things, and it relates back a little bit to what you were saying about um, how inadequate sometimes our plans are. And we plan three or four or five songs knowing full well that that's just a, a small morsel on the plate today. And it's not very much. My congregation, I think we've all experienced this, surprises me at how they let the Holy Spirit use whatever it is to speak to them. And that's one of the assurances that I think we all have as worship pastors. We don't want to be sloppy. We don't want to be less than excellent. But even at our best, it's never going to be heavenly worship. We all know that. But God takes what we have, and we walk in confidence that he's going to use that. In fact, what surprises me sometimes is I get responses back on things that I didn't even know were going that direction. And, you know, they heard something, they felt something, and I go, well, that wasn't what it was about. Well, no, that's what the Holy Spirit was speaking. And God constantly surprises me, and that's an assurance as a worship pastor that I'm not in this by myself. I'm up doing my best, but God's working behind the scenes, really speaking into people's lives. Yeah, in, yeah. in spite of us sometimes, you're right. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, I think the reminder for me constantly, every week, is my perfectionist attitude wants every note to be hit right, you know, every guitar riff to be correct, you know, the drums to play the right thing. And I'll leave the stage sweating like crazy and thinking, oh, man, that was the worst thing I've ever yeah. done. And yet somebody is touched and moved by that. And so I've, I've learned from my congregation that the minute I am singing, the minute I leave the stage, I have to let all that go and just say that was my offering, as small as I might think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and the second thing, the big thing for me that I'm just now learning is um, how our congregations want to be caught up in the story. We often prepare as if 
they're not wanting to do that. And uh, I, I wrote a song just this last year that, that was centered around the death of my mom and just going through that process. And it's not a great song. I wouldn't consider myself a great songwriter, but that is the song that this, my congregation latches onto. They love that song. They love it when we play it. And I don't want to play it that much because I'm like, man, it's not that good. And it's just, but every time we play it, someone says, man, you know, this relates to my life in this way. And, and they're longing for that. You know, we often, it's easy for us to be up on stage and get in the midst of our planning and forget that essentially that's what we're doing is we are, are singing songs together to remind us that we are a community to glorify God. So, that's um, good. yeah. That's great. Uh, uh, listening to you all talk, it just reminds me of as, as worship pastors, we not only have to be in love with the Lord, we have to be in love with our congregation. And until we know them and know where they've walked and know where they've been that week and love them, <laughs> it's difficult to lead them. When I got to my church in Fullerton, it was a church full of engineers and educators. All three churches before that were, I would say they were heart churches, and I end up at a head church and I'm leading worship and I just couldn't I couldn't take them anywhere and my executive pastor said I said how do I do this he said well if you think they're head people then get through them through their head and so I how do you do well teach read scripture we started reading scripture a lot I started teaching concepts on worship I had to get through to their heart through their head and that was totally backwards and I had done my first 25 years of ministry but once I got to know the congregation, go through their head, we got to their heart. We worshiped in a wonderful way, but I had to find out who they were, and then I had to fall in love with them. So thank you all for, for sharing. We've, we've circled the block several times, but thank you. I hope this has been a, a helpful discussion today.